his majesty, his beauty, his glory, his power, his kindness, his love. Give him praise for grace. Give him praise. We worship you, Lord. I am all Sunday. Excellent is your name, Lord. You are beautiful. Merciful. We give you worship, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Karabo Satay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, what matters the most is the presence of God. He said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm right there. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. God bless you. Amen going to be launching straight into the teaching tonight. We're so delighted to have the bishop with us tonight. Amen. Looking sharp. Amen. Looking sharp. Hallelujah. Yesterday he looked like someone who just crossed the border from Mexico to the United States. But today he is looking like someone who is in Texas. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> All we need to do is just to give him a Texas heart. Hallelujah. The cowboy heart. <laughs> Glory to God. I believe we are in for a very wonderful time today. I want to assure you of one thing. I want to assure you of one thing. The road to heaven. It's not a broad one. It is a narrow one. M most of the time, people just want the things that make them happy on earth. But they do not know that those things come through the use of kingdom keys. Are you listening to me? You see, the kingdom inheritance is available to every believer. But if you are going to have access to it, you have to understand that there are exceeding great and precious promises left for us in scripture. Promises you can bank on. Why? Because the promiser is a man of integrity. Hallelujah. I don't want to be the kind of Christian that answers the name I want to live the life are you with me I want to live the life and please take note ah thank you Jesus when we march when we see Jesus we're not going to be rewarded by how much money we made on planet earth Nah. But by the number of souls 
that we bring into the kingdom. The very thing that brought Jesus from heaven to earth must take us from our homes, from our churches, to the world out there. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And if I were you, or if I were any Christian at all, I would like to learn and develop the skill necessary to accomplish that assignment. God will reward you. The Bible says not just hearers are justified, but the doers of the word. Come again tonight with the intention of not just learning something, but you are learning because you want to do. Am I communicating? Am I communicating? Our God is a good God. I want to assure you, this ministry cannot remain the same. I'm going to be in the driving seat with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I mean it when I said, when I said, we're going to build on people who are interested in what God is interested in. If God himself will cut off unfruitful branches, are you listening to me now? This is God we are talking about. That, that story was not told by Peter. It wasn't told by Apostle Paul or John or, or whatever. It came from the mouth of the master himself. I am the vine. You are the branches. Any branch that doesn't bear fruit, I'm going to cut it off. If my daddy is going to cut it off, I'm going to be like him. I'm, I have to learn how to cut off unfruitful branches because they create more problems. Are you with me now? No hard feelings. If there are 10 of us that make it to heaven, glory to God. Amen. But I want to get 10 out of 10. Not 10 out of 100. Are you listening to me? I want to encourage you. Listen to me. This is a serious matter. It's not about me. It's not about him. It's not about her. It's about Jesus. If you consider the pain that they had to go through to get you and I saved, the patience, the endurance that they have had to put up with your idiosyncrasies and your craziness, to get you to understand one simple message that he that has the son has life and he that has not the son has not life you know I, I'm sorry bishop I'm taking a little bit part of your time you know I, 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 I cringe when I see people being comfortable with your parents your sisters and your brothers Remaining unsaved. And, and you, you want to pamper them. You want to buy everything. To, listen to me. It's an emergency. If they die in that state. There is no room for reformation. What will be your profit when you are in heaven. And you are seeing your daddy in hell. You want to help him. But you can't help him at that time. Because it's too late. It's too late. You will make heaven. Oh, no, I'm not hearing your amen. Okay, maybe you don't understand. You don't want to go there. I will make heaven know. Uh -huh, praise God. Please join me tonight. Let's be all standing as we welcome the bishop. Amen. For the two of the school. A wonderful time yesterday. Hallelujah. Thank you, bishop. Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Praise God. I hope this microphone is sounding Praise God. Please take your seat. Yeah, I think this one is better. This one is for recruits. <laughs> this one is for generals. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Praise God. Now, how many of you were not here last night? You were not here last night. Raise your hand. Wow, where were you? Were you in a nightclub? Okay. <laughs> well, 
I'm not going to go over our terms and conditions because of time. So, in case you break any one of them, it won't be my fault and it, you won't claim ignorance because every other person know the rules. Is it not so? Yeah. It's like the one that I said you have to switch off your phone or put it on silence. Because if your phone rings and if it's a phone that befits my dignity, I will confiscate it. But if it's beneath my dignity, you will pay me how much? 10,000. There's no negotiation. Welcome. I asked after you yesterday. Good to see you. So just in case the phone rings today, I know that uh, God has answered my prayers. Amen. Bishop, people who sell coffee, they pray for the business to move. Amen. Now, yesterday we began this journey and I stopped at defining evangelism. Because it's a school, I would want you to remind me what evangelism is. So, who is going to... How many of you were here yesterday? Let me see those of you who were here. Were you here yesterday? You were not. Where were you? You went somewhere. Were you here? You were here. So what's evangelism? Evangelism was defined yesterday as proclaiming, declaring, Evangelism can be said to be proclaiming, declaring, did you write it down? Yes, sir. Well, you didn't go through it. Okay, madam, were you here yesterday? Okay, so what's evangelism? Give her the microphone. Evangelism is the past mm -hmm. or duty or work or proclaiming or preaching, or declaring the word of the gospel to the unsaved with the aim of bringing them to Christ. Wow. I think she almost tried. Right? Were you there yesterday? Ah. When you said somehow, maybe your spirit was here and your body was somewhere else. Okay, your body was here. Uh-huh. Because it's, it's a disaster if your spirit is in one place and your body is somewhere. Okay, you want to define. Don't cheat her. Uh -huh. Give it to her. But she tried. You can see that women are better students than men. Hmm. Evangelism is a mandate. Something you must do. No, you are Whether, looking at the no. book, madam. Something you must do, yeah. whether it's convenient for you or not. Even when you are sick, you must evangelize. Okay, is that no matter the definition? Where you are, she has defined one. You, you gave two definitions. No, yes. I gave one definition. Okay. Uh, uh, this is my own explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Madam, this is how people feel exam. No. When a teacher teaches you, eh? And a right exam. What is expecting is that what he has given to you, you should give it back to him. You explained it like this. That uh -huh. is a mandate. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That is a mandate. But, Something you must do. Uh -huh. but Whether it's convenient for you or uh -huh. not. But she, she tried. We can give her like how many percent now? 90. Were you there? 
Look at, look at the person giving 90%. She was not even there. That's a bad teacher. You recorded it. Okay, so you listen to it. Why can you just give 90% like that? That's been too generous with, uh, with uh, Maki. Eh? Yeah, she tried. Thank you, madam. Praise God. We said evangelism is a task or duty or work of what? Proclaiming or preaching or telling or announcing or writing or declaring or showing what? The gospel to who? To the non-Christian with what? The aim of converting them. It's, that's the definition, right? So in that definition, we see the basic requirement. You see, if you understand evangelism from that perspective, you are okay. Because you see, it's a mandate. It's a task. And like she was saying, a task is a mandate. It's something you must do. It's mandatory. You don't do it because it's convenient. You don't do it because it's comfortable for you. You don't do it because you feel led. I mean, before, I used to hear some Christians say, oh, I only evangelize when I feel led. Listen to me, that's being stupid. You think you are, you are being spiritual, but you are just being stupid. How many things do you feel led to do? Especially in this age and time. If it was in the 70s and 80s, I believe you. But these days, people don't get led to do what God wants them to do. They do what is in their mind. Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. It's not as practical as it used to be today. You can see your brother in need and dying. You will watch them die. But those days, it was not like that. Sacrifice was easy because, I mean, th th this is the life of a disciplined follower of Christ. You deny yourself for the kingdom. You seek first the kingdom. So don't tell me you, 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 you only evangelize when you feel led. It's a mandate. Somebody says it's a mandate. It's something you must do. And look at the different ways of doing this work. You can proclaim, you can you can preach, you can tell, you can announce, you can write. How many of you have started writing your own tract? Now, by Saturday, I want to see your tract. Amen? It's not difficult to write your own story. And let me tell you, the advantages of anything that is in print, it outlives you. Number one. Number two, it, it reaches more people. You see this? Even when I'm gone, for the next 100, 200, 1,000 years, this will still be here. I did a school of evangelism in somewhere in California. I've forgotten the name of the town. And they brought tracts. One of the tracts we used for the practical. It was a tract written by, is it Charles Podger? Like 150 years ago. That should be Spurgeon, right? I was like, wow. Can you imagine that 150 years from now, somebody is going to read this my story and get saved? So 150 years after I'm gone, I'm still getting people saved. I want 
to see how we can flood the world with tracts. Is somebody listening to me? So you can do it in writing. You can declare it. You can show it with your lifestyle or by films. And look at all the things that we are trying to proclaim, preach, tell, announce, write, declare, show. It's the gospel. What is the gospel? Look at First Corinthians. First Corinthians 15 from verse 1 to 4. What is the gospel? Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, in these verses of scripture, I'm going to show you what the gospel is. What the gospel is capable of doing. In fact, if you don't have any reason why you must preach this gospel, when you see what the gospel can do, it's enough reason. Verse 1 and 2 shows us what this gospel can do. Look at it. He said, by this gospel, you stand. This gospel has the capacity to make man to stand. Because from the very beginning, every human being is on the ground. Any human being you see, whether they are the president of any country, they are the president of a corporation. They are, they are what, whatever position you see them. Without Christ in them, they are on the ground. Genesis 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man. From where? From the dust of the ground. Now, this should help you to see people in their proper perspective. When you see them that they are on the ground, the only force that can lift them up to sit together with Christ in heavenly places is the gospel. Only the gospel does that. Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, You were dead in your sins and in your trespasses as he quickened. We kinged you and raised you to sit together with him in heavenly places. My goodness, it's only the gospel that has that capacity. Every human being you know, without Christ, they may be the richest men in the world, they may be the most educated, they may be the most beautiful, they may be the most gorgeous, they may be the most whatever. Without Christ, they are on the ground. In fact, there are three characteristic traits I want to drive home to help you see any human being without Christ. Number one is that every human being without Christ is dry. Put up Genesis 1 verse 9 and 10. Genesis 1 verse 9 and 10. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. And let what? Let what? Let the dry land appear. Now verse 10. And God called what? Called what? The dry land what? Earth. That is to say, anything that is earth, Earthy, earthly, earthing is number one, characteristic, characteristically what? Dry. So when you look at people 
see them in their proper state. Any human being without Christ is what? Dry. God brought Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37 to a valley full of what? Dry bones. It's not just the bones that are dry. They are dry. That's why we deal with dry skin, dry lips. Dry bones. There's no way you will look at a valley full of dry bones and not have compassion for them. It will provoke compassion in you. So whether it's one or ten or one hundred or one thousand without Christ, they are what? Dry. Number two characteristic trait, Genesis 2 verse 7. Put up Genesis 2 verse 7. Apart from the fact that every human being without Christ is dry. Number two, every human being without Christ is dirty. And the Lord God formed man of the, of the what? Of the what? Dust. Somebody say dust. Now another word for dust there is dirt. Somebody say dirt. That is to say, every human being without Christ is dirty. Haven't you noticed that it doesn't take any effort to be dirty? Huh? You take a bath at night before you go to bed. You wake up in, mo in the morning. Why do you still take a bath? Eh? Because you are dirty. What did you do when you were sleeping? Because you see, it doesn't take any effort to be dirty. It takes a lot of effort to be clean. Look at me looking, speak and span. Yeah? Bishop, it's your fault too. <laughs> you know when I preached here in January They bought me two suits This is one of them eh? When I went to preach for uh, Pastor Oduyemi As she saw me like this She screamed She said Bishop You mean you wear a suit Because for years I stopped wearing a suit When I go to Europe and America, I, I, I don't like wearing suit. Eh? I don't want people to mistake me for an African American. I'm not an African American. I'm a Nigerian. So I wear my Nigerian everything. When you see me, you just know where I came from. You shouldn't be confused. And besides, you know, wearing suit here in a hot environment, sometimes I wonder how people survive. But since I came to this spring, the, the suit mandate has rubbed off on me. <laughs> That's why you should be careful who you hang out with. <laughs> What they are carrying will just jump on you. <laughs> Praise God. Every human being is dirty. Filthy. Stinking. Smelling. There's nobody who does not smell. Everybody smells. That's why we bath. We take a bath. Because when you take a bath, it reduces your body smell by almost 90%. And 
and then because you don't you are not confident of your own smell you have to hire a smell that's what we call perfume or cologne every time you are using a perfume or a cologne you are telling yourself your own smell you are not comfortable with it you are not confident you know so you have to hire a smell so that people will think that you smell nice praise God just turn to your neighbor and do I mean turn to your neighbor and do <laughs> everybody smells so if somebody has told you you smell it's not an insult I don't know why sometimes we take simple questions as as confirmation you look at somebody who is short and you say ah you are so short they are angry why are you angry are you not short hey because the, the way you said it how else would i have said it <laughs> I saw somebody in America. I said, wow! You are so fat! I mean, I've not seen that kind of fat person before. So, I was just, I was just, and the person was offended. He said, no! My friend came and said, no, in America, you don't, you don't, you don't talk like that. I said, how? I mean, I'm just so surprised. The person is like four of me. How can I see somebody, only one person that is four of me, and I will not be surprised? <laughs> if it's in my dream, I will say, okay, it's dreamland. But this one is real, and it's four of me. Only you? Why should only you? Only you? Praise God. <laughs> I mean, simple question. Like, are you crazy? It's a question. It's a question. Don't, don't say, oh, oh, oh. So, so now you are calling me a, a, a crazy. Eh? You are calling me crazy now, eh? I will show you that I'm crazy. You see, I only asked you, are you crazy? See, it's either yes or no. So this one now that you are going to show me that you are crazy, so I was really right. Because I know that every one of us will have our three to five minutes madness in a 24 hour time frame. So the reason I asked you, are you crazy? It's a simple question. Is it your turn? Is it your time? I just wanted to know if that is your own three to five minutes time. Uh -huh. So that, let's know, let's take you as you are. <laughs> eh? So why are you angry? Simple question. Husband and wife, I mean, Learn to understand simple question. Your wife asks you, are you crazy? It's a question. It's a question. Is it your time? <laughs> because you know our own time too will come. Eh? <laughs> so you will ask her, is it your time? Amen. <laughs> Everybody is filthy. There is no body that is clean. Read your Bible. He said there is not one good. No, not one. You know, sometimes we want to brag, oh, you know, I'm a good person. You know, I'm a good person. You know, when someone tells me that, that you know I'm a good person, I just tell them, the fact that you are the one saying it means you are not a good person. 
Because if you were good, I'll be the one to tell you. And let me tell you, you are not a good person. <laughs> and they get annoyed. <laughs> I say, look at it. You are now showing it. Amen. Everybody. That's why we all need Christ. He's the only one who can clean us. We're all filthy people. So no matter how you put your best foot forward, it will still be as a filthy rag. Haven't you tried to put your best foot forward? Eh? And somebody rubbished it. They didn't just rubbish it. That is what it is. It's rubbish. I remember one young man who wanted to get married. He bought this nice material. And he was so proud of himself that he was going to meet the parents of the girl. On getting there, the material that he was wearing is what they use as cutting. <laughs> the exact material. Now, how can you be proud again? <laughs> I mean, he was so proud of himself. Hey, he said, God, thank you. This material, I know how it has cost me, how much it has cost me. You know, he dressed so well. Only to get there, when he saw, he saw the cutting, it was the material. How do you escape that one? So no matter how good you think you are, even at your best, without Christ, you are filthy. Number three characteristic trait is that every human being without Christ is dead. Genesis 2 verse 7. Put it up again. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and what happened? And man became a living being. That is to say before he became a living being, he was dead. Every human being born into this world is born dead on arrival from Genesis chapter 3. Every human being. The downside about being dead is that the dead does not know they are dead. No dead body knows they are dead. So sometimes when you tell some people, look, the reason why you need Christ is so that you can, you can come alive. They are wondering. It's because they are dead. Without Christ in you, you are dead. You can be dead and still look nice. How many of you have been to mortuaries before? Have, haven't you seen some dead bodies? They look so good, so good. That even you will like to die. It's like, wow, is this how it is to be dead? You just want to die. Just to look that good. But it's dead. Only Christ forces life. Look at that Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. And what? Breathe. Somebody say breathe. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. What does the Bible say? Paul said all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. One translation says all scripture is God breathed. So when God was breathing, 
into this mass of dry, dirty, and dead body. He was actually preaching or proclaiming or prophesying into it. And the moment it received God, he came alive. Because you can't receive God and remain dead. Jesus said the hour has come when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and those that hear, oh my God, they shall come alive. You see, the reason why they have not gotten saved yet is because they have not heard his voice. When they hear, they will come alive. Just like you and I, the day we heard his voice, we came alive. That mass of mud had been there. We don't know. For eons of time, 